actually going to go ahead and hit record now. Um, but we are recording tonight, and so um, we're very thankful that you're here. Uh, I will introduce Joe Burton, who will now um, oh, start us off. Okay, I want to welcome everybody to this webinar. I'm especially grateful that we have Bishop Willimon to speak with us tonight. Uh, he teaches Christian ministry, professor of Christian ministry at Duke Divinity School. He's been there for a number of years. I, I became acquainted with him, uh, at least with, what, with his writings back many years ago. He co-authored a book with Stanley Harawas called Resident Aliens. It's a very prov provocative book at the time and suggested that those of us who are Christians were, should be, consider ourselves resident aliens, I guess, in, in the world, if I I'm, if I'm remember correctly. Um, so about a year ago, uh, uh, Bishop Willimon spoke at, at uh, Epworth Methodist over in, um, in Durham with the topic that he's going to speak on tonight. And when I, I did not hear that, that talk, a, res a recovering racist, but I thought at the time that was very, very interesting. And, and, I, and in this time that we're in now with Black Lives Matter, I thought it was especially important that we hear what he has to say about that. So uh, welcome, Bishop Willeman, and I, I'm very anxious to hear what you have to, to tell us. Well, thank you, Joe. It's wonderful to be back at Highlands, reminding me of some of my previous visits uh, at Highlands Church a long time ago. And uh, Kevin Quick, uh, your music person, has been a sometime student of mine. Uh, well, uh, my title uh, may be more provocative than actually of interest, but uh, let me just tell you about how I characterize myself as a Christian thinking about matters of race. Uh, the, when I was one year old in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, a group of Greenville, South Carolina white men uh, removed a young black man from a jail cell in Pickens, South Carolina, where he was being held. He hadn't been charged. He was to be charged the next day with uh, stabbing a white taxi cab driver to death, but uh, he hadn't been charged. They, re they removed him from the jail cell. They took him out to uh, the Greenville County, Pickens County line, and they tortured him to death and called the African-American undertaker in Greenville and told him there's a body out on Bramlett Road uh, that happened when I was one year old. Uh, I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina. Grew up in Buckham Street Methodist Church. Uh, my mother taught school at Greenville High School. Uh, funny thing, uh, nobody in Greenville ever mentioned the Willie Earl lynching to me. Even though uh, after the lynching there was a trial and the trial attracted international attention Rebecca West uh, did a famous story in the New Yorker on the trial. Uh, during the trial, the jurors acquitted all of the lynchers, even though 21 of them signed confessions, uh, they were all acquitted. And uh, so the lynching of Willie Earl became, was a sort of double tragedy, uh, which occurred in my hometown and I never knew anything about it until I got to college, it was mentioned. Uh, years later, when I was sent by the bishop to serve an inner city church in Greenville, South Carolina, I uh, went to the Greenville Public Library and started my own exploration of the lynching of Willie Earl and its, its aftermath. And I'm assuming that that story that I've just told about growing up white, Southern, in a Southern town, and yet having to learn as you grew up a lot of history that was never claimed as history, never mentioned to you. I'm assuming that that story matches many of your stories. Uh, to be a white Southerner 
uh, growing up in the South, a legally segregated racially uh, culture, which I grew up in, in the 50s and 60s, um, means that we uh, have to discover, rediscover a lot of our history that wasn't mentioned to us. Uh, however, I'm, I'm thinking about that history in white and black. I'm, I'm thinking about that as a Christian. And uh, as I looked into the Willie Earl uh, lynching and the uh, so-called trial afterwards, uh, I discovered uh, a Methodist preacher named Holly Lynn who was serving in Pickens, South Carolina. His wife had died just a couple of months earlier. He had a baby girl. Uh, I knew her in college, uh, Kathy Lynn. But uh, Holly Lynn, the Methodist preacher, uh, preached a sermon. And the title of his sermon was, Who Lynched Willie Earl? Preached in about two weeks after Willie Earl had been removed from a Pickens, South Carolina jail cell. And in the sermon, Holly uh, basically said, uh, you know, asked rhetorically, who lynched Willie Earl? And then Holly said, well, we all know the answer to that. A group of men from another county, from Greenville. Most of them signed written confessions for the FBI that they participated in the lynching. They were proud of what they did. Uh, these men from another county lynched Willie Earl. And then Holly in his sermon paused for emphasis and he said, uh, who lynched Willie Earl? We did. And then he launched into a stem winder of a sermon in which he said, uh, we produced this horrible act of violence. Uh, the jokes we told, the mores that we put up with, the way that we vote and deny other people to vote. And so, who lynched Willie Earl became, I think, one of the most important sermons ever preached in a Methodist church in South Carolina. And it became the title of my book, Who Lynched Willie Earl. Uh, and in the book, I talk a little bit about my own attempt to come to terms with my own uh, uh, white racist past. Um, and then uh, also, though, moving as Holy Lynn moved in his sermon, to say, what should Christians be thinking about this today? And that, to me, is what is important for us to talk about tonight. And, and that is, um, since we do, as white Christians, uh, share this heritage of, of, of racism, uh, how then should we live? What should we be thinking about? And um, here's some things that I immediately think about that I found helpful in my own trying to think about this as a Christian, which I think is very important that we try to think about this important subject as many others are now thinking about it, but that we think about it as Christians. Uh, first thing I think about is uh, we note is, you know, when Christians think about things, we go to scripture for help. Uh, race as a designator of human beings, human beings designated on the basis of their physical characteristics and then judged and oppressed on the basis of those physical characteristics. Uh, that is really an unknown concept in the Bible. The Bible knows no such concept of race. Uh, race as it has influenced American history basically was invented in the European Enlightenment uh, by Enlightenment, enlightened white European men like Voltaire, uh, like Thomas Jefferson, like Benjamin Franklin. And uh, that is that uh, in Enlightenment, race became an important, for the first time really ever in human history, a, an important designator of people. Uh, is it a coincidence that this racist enlightenment thinking came along hand in hand with colonialism, with uh, European uh, putting, Europeans putting people of color in many continents 
uh, in bondage in, in, in colonies, I, I think there is a definite connection. If you're going to colonize people, if you're going to enslave people, slavery goes right hand in hand with colonization. Uh, you, you need an ideology that kind of backs you up and makes that justified and the enlightenment provided. The sad thing is for Christians that, that we Christians bought into the enlightenment patterns, even though the makers of the enlightenment were not Christians, they, they were often saw themselves at odds with the church and with Christian history. Uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, being one of those people, um, he was a deist uh, more than a, a kind of orthodox Christian by any sense. But um, sadly, the church just bought into these racist notions and they infected Christianity. In fact, I, I would say that Christian attitudes, white Christian attitudes about race are one of the most remarkable sellouts <laughs> of the gospel of the Christian faith that we've experienced it. So for us Christians, uh, talking about race means confessing that we allowed the gospel to get horribly distorted and warped uh, through racist, unchristian ideas. And yet, nevertheless, it's, it's a reality. So much so that Martin Luther King could say uh, that 11 o'clock Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the week. Sadly, uh, right now, many years after Martin Luther King, uh, when I go to a sports event, when I go to a restaurant, as we used to do before the pandemic, uh, when I go to school, I'm in a more racially diverse, integrated environment than I am when I worship Jesus Christ in my church. And that is a, Christians believe that is a sin to be confessed. In fact, my friend Jim Wallace calls racism America's original sin. It is kind of the central fact of American Christianity to be reckoned with. So uh, how do we reckon with it? Well, uh, I think, as I've just said, uh, confession. You know, uh, we, we have a chief executive who has bragged, I've never apologized. I will never apologize. To which I say, yeah, and he ain't a Methodist, because at Highlands United Methodist Church, I bet on a regular basis when you gather, and you will gather again, what do you do? You're, you get together, and the, the preacher stands up and says, repeat after me. I've been bad. I, I've done things I shouldn't have done. I've done things that I thought were good and turned out to be bad. I, I, uh, I, I have these inclinations that I can't control. I have these biases over which I have no... Uh, in short, I sin. And that's when we all give thanks to God that Jesus Christ saves sinners, only sinners. So, so confession is important. Uh, this is a prejudiced Christian comment, but uh, I think it's gonna be real hard for America to confess its sins and race, to be honest, to tell the truth. Uh, because if, if you don't believe in a God who forgives, if you don't believe in a savior who loves to save sinners, I think you got a real problem. You got to really get it right. You got to look really, really good. Your history has got to be really pure. And uh, well, Christians are liberated from all that. And we can tell the truth. We can confess. And, and in fact, I think um, our sins in white and black, in white racial injustice and violence. Uh, what a marvelous occasion uh, to recover the church as a place of truth. Uh, let me compliment you, Highlands, your social concerns committee, or whatever this committee is called. Uh, uh, you're, you're doing what, you're demonstrating that Jesus Christ gives us the resources not to lie, not to deceive, not to dissemble, not to say stupid things like, it's not about race, it's about our glorious Southern heritage. It's not about race, it's about states' rights. Uh, I heard all that growing up. 
as many of you did, uh, well, Christians don't have to do that. We can say, hey, uh, Lord, forgive me. Um, uh, and, and, and let me add here, we're, we're Methodist. Uh, that means we're Wesleyans. And that means that you and I are part of that stunning Wesleyan vision that Christ calls us not only to be forgiven of our sins, but, but also to grow in grace. It was the Wesleyan contention, which just drove Lutherans and Reform people nuts. Uh, it was a Wesleyan contention, you actually can be better than you were bred to be. Uh, your parents were good people, but they instilled in you a lot of wrong ideas and all, but that's okay because Jesus Christ, uh, the closer you grow to him, the better you become. Uh, I'm not a perfect person. I'm an old white guy from the South, but trust me, you, you would not have wanted to know me before Jesus got a grip on me and began, uh, we call it, we have the fancy word, sanctification, growth in grace. And so what you're doing tonight is kind of what Christians do. And we, we sit around and we try to be honest and we try to tell the truth. And, and then we try, to, we try to pray, Lord, deal with me, work with me. Uh, I saw in the Black Lives Matter uh, during the, when demonstrations were at their height, a reporter out in the streets of Raleigh. And uh, there were some angry people and there were angry words and it was tense and there was tear gas and all. Uh, and out there at like 11 o'clock at night, he encountered an older woman. Uh, maybe it was one of you for all I know. And uh, she had a mask on and all. And he said, well, you're out here with all these young people at night. And you know what he was thinking, you're too old to be out here in the streets at night. What are you doing out here in a situation like this? And she said, you know, I should have been here 20, 30 years ago. I should have had my voice count. Uh, I should have been present during the civil rights movement. I, I was around then. But she said, I just thank God that I got to live long enough to be here tonight. I'm here. Now, that's a beautiful testimonial, uh, particularly if you're my age and you're always looking for older people doing good things. But, uh, but it's, it's also an amazing testimony to God. And Wesleyan Christians might say, uh, it's a testimony to the grace of God working in you. Uh, Richard Heitzenreiter, who teaches Wesleyan history at Duke Divinity School, retired now, but uh, he once said that there's, there's no more abused word than grace in the Methodist church, because grace, too many times, the way that word is used is, uh, I love you just the way you are, you're, you're doing great, uh, promise me you won't change a thing, you're, you're beautiful. Uh, no, he said, Wesleyan grace is the power of God to be changed, to live a different life than the life you were bred to live. And those of us who are white, Southern American people, we should perk up and say, wow, we've got a God that enables us to do what a lot of people don't think Americans are going to be able to do. And that's white Americans to do better, to have a different consciousness, uh, to repent uh, and turn around and, and move forward. But we're bold to believe the grace of Christ is able. Well, I can stop there and want to see where that touches uh, with some of you. Okay. Thank you, Bishop. And um... Any who have questions, if you would please put them in the Q&A box and I will pass them on to Bishop Willeman. Don't be shy. <laughs> Maybe my host, uh, is Jim on? Uh... Yeah. I can find him really quick. Is he on? I, he, he might 
since he's kind of primed for this and he's the one that thought it would, Joe, uh, thought it'd be a good idea. Joe, what's, how do you respond? Got on mute? Joe, you're muted. I think what, okay. what you said is, is very helpful to me in particular. I, uh, I grew up in Southern Georgia, probably with the same experiences that you had. And um, we, we, we do have this continuing um, ballot, battle, I guess, with trying to, to uh, repent and, 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 and be different. And uh, so I, I was glad to hear uh, what you had to say about that. But I'm wondering, um, what about, how, how did you, at what point did you see the light and what, what brought you to that realization in terms of race, ra racial uh, culture in your, in your yeah. South Carolina? Well, you know, I'm, I'm sure it was, well, I'd say, it was many people witnessing to me, talking to me, correcting me, making me uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, uh, I tell in my book a story that I've told again in my memoir, and that is at 16 years old, I was sent um, by my church to a youth conference at Lake Junaluska, where many of you have probably been. And uh, when I got to the youth conference, a, uh, one of the adults said, uh, you, you, you're such a nice boy. Would you be willing to, to room with a, uh, uh, a Negro? And I said, yes, any, anything to get you to think I'm a nice boy. <laughs> so I, I roomed with a 16 year old. He was a Methodist. He was from my town, Greenville. He Jeez. was a John Wesley Methodist Church. I was a member of Buncombe Street Methodist Church. Uh, we didn't know each other because we went to different schools, even though the schools were four blocks away. We, we didn't know each other, even though we went to churches just a few blocks away because he was black and I was white. That night, uh, after the sessions, and I cannot remember what the sessions were on, uh, but that night we just started talking. And he uh, courageously talked to me about what it was like to grow up in Greenville, black. And about midnight, I realized, wow, my Greenville is not Greenville to him. And uh, at some point during that evening, he said, uh, don't you see, uh, these laws are not just meant to keep me in my place. These laws keep you in your place. And he said, I can't believe you let your mama and daddy uh, tell you where you can go and who you can associate with. Well, that punched my button because at 16, yeah, I, I was against any parental uh, control. And um, I say that when the sun dawned on Lake Junaluska that Sunday morning, I came out and had to blink my eyes. I wasn't living in the same world. He had literally transformed me, my world. Uh, and I was transformed in the process. In fact, today, if you talk about being born again, I'm gonna think of that night first. Uh, I really got born again. And there were lots of other moments like that, thank God, in which uh, my eyes were open. Uh, I was blind, but now I can see. I, uh, uh, I'm so, uh, and I believe ultimately, Joe, uh, I'd have to say it wasn't only because of courageous people uh, who were willing to engage me and, and my limitations, uh, but, but I believe God was in it. I believe God was behind it. I believe that we have the kind of God that's just constantly using other people to get to us, to transform us. So. That's how I explain it. We've had a lot of uh, questions come in. Okay. And um, so Bishop at Highland, um, we're doing um, a program we're calling Act Now to End Racism. 
And as part of it, we just um, had a book study last night and um, talked about the book White Fragility. Mm. And um, so one of them wanted to know if you had a reaction to that, but some of the other questions sort of lead into that and how, um, how do we deal with, you know, the white Christians who feel like they don't need to confess and repent about racism uh, or say, um, you know, I, I found the book white fragility. I, I quoted my book. I, I found it helpful. It, it mm -hmm. just, you know, and um, I, it, it, the title says it all and that uh, we, white people don't like to have these uncomfortable discussions. Um, as a preacher, I realize a, a lot of people come to church thinking that's where I can avoid uncomfortable discussions. Uh, well, sorry, we worship a crucified savior and <clears throat> uncomfortable discussion, something Jesus seems to delight in. Anyway, um, I'm hesitant to criticize the book because I think it is so helpful. I think it's a great one for y'all to study. Uh, the trouble, one of the troubles with white fragility, I think, is it's, 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 and I don't mean this to sound as narrow and prejudiced. It's not a, it's not a Christian book in that uh, the author does a really good job of telling white people, you're not right. You got to get right. You got to think differently. You got to talk differently. Uh, you can't say this. You need to say that and all. You got to get your consciousness raised. You got to get woke. You got to, you know. Um, well, I, I want to say to the author, uh, trust me, we got a bigger problem here than simply education. I wish reading a book. I wish getting some more information. I wish hearing about this from an intelligent, articulate person like you would change things dramatically. But I, I think this kind of demon cannot be driven out <laughs> except through prayer. Uh, I think we need uh, God to get in here and do for us what we can't do for ourselves. One unfortunate, uh, and I heard a great critique of white fragility. Some of you may have heard it, have heard it uh, early this week on NPR in the morning, heard an African-American scholar talking about it. And he said, you know, my, my problem is that, uh, you know, we've been waiting for white people to get their consciousness raised for a long, long time. And we've been waiting for white people to become more sensitive about what they say and how they talk and how they understand. He said, come on, how about getting busy? Uh, how about acting now? before your consciousness gets raised. Uh, don't wait for that. Uh, and I like that. And I, I noticed that the, the title of this group you said is Act Now mm -hmm. uh, to End Racism. So I think, you know, read the book, that's good. But also say now, God, what do you want us to do? Yes. And we're Westlands and we're big on doing and yeah. action, not only the religion of the heart, but the religion of the hands. And uh, I believe God will will lead you there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so for those who aren't from Highland, you can go to our website and find out more about what we're doing. Um, oh, good. Give an advertisement. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's a, um, there's several different avenues to get involved there in that program. Uh, and, and let me just say that I, I don't, uh, I'm amazed by the turnout tonight uh, and, and with this discussion. But uh, I think we in the predominantly white church, namely the United Methodist Church, um, we shouldn't underestimate how many Christians, white Christians, uh, God has placed a burden on their heart. They want to do better. Uh, they, they want to be better. They want to be part of this movement of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and uh, I'll just say, woe be under the church that thinks it can just keep smiling and not mention this and, and it'll go past. I know a woman who uh, started looking for a church a week after George Floyd's murder. And she said, you know, I, I don't expect my church to have all the answers. I don't expect my church to, um, you know, uh, know exactly what to do, what I, but darn, 
She said, I came to church. You said, I went, tuned into church uh, the week after George Floyd's murder. Not one mention of that in the service, not in the sermon, not even in the prayers. And uh, she said, if, if my church has nothing to say in such a moment, when millions of people are out in the streets, if my church has nothing to say in that moment, I, I worry that my church has nothing to say. So that's a word of encouragement. Yeah. And that leads right in. So there are several, um, well, more than several, there are quite a few um, Methodist clergy on this meeting tonight, uh, North Carolina conference, some of who uh, are brand new in their appointments, others who maybe been there for a while, um, but we've had several um, ask for uh, your advice on um, how to help lead our churches in having uh, these discussions, um, how clergy uh, can lead during this time. And a uh, good question, and I hope I hope there people are thinking about that. Good, uh, that's that's the start. Uh, <clears throat> I think in this double pandemic that we're in. It really is a call for leadership. And uh, in many ways, we're seeing those who cannot lead, <laughs> um, not to mention any names, uh, and, and we're also seeing people standing up and leading. Uh, I, I tell my fellow preachers, uh, look at Dr. Fauci. Uh, he just wanted to be a doctor. I guess that's all he ever did. I don't know if he's ever had a uh, course in public speaking or anything. And, uh, but here in the middle of the pandemic, uh, America is hanging on every word he says, and he has to be appropriately reassuring. He has to scold us when he needs to. He has to bring out our better angels. And I said, Lord, the pandemic has made this doctor a preacher. And it, it does seem that in, in times such as these, uh, God's people keep asking, is there any word from the Lord? If, if you got some insight uh, from scripture, uh, from the church's witness that is apropos in the present moment. So we can preach. We can do what Holly Lynn did there as a young pastor in Pickens, South Carolina. And we can say, Lord, help me talk about things that my people don't want to talk about. And Lord, you're so good at this yourself. You'll you'll tell me how. Uh, so uh, we we have that uh, in our being. Also, I think assume. I'm not always the best at this, but but try to assume people do want uh, that that the Holy Spirit is at work in people's hearts, uh, attempting to change them, uh, raising questions, making them uneasy with their positions. Uh, uh, stirring them up when they watch something on TV and they think, wow, somebody ought to do. And, and then uh, for the church to be a place that experiments with, with new means of, uh, of, of, of action, of doing things. Uh, and uh, in my book, uh, I talk about a number of, just about all my examples are from Methodist churches, I think. Uh, where pastors are uh, like uh, inviting in uh, a congregation, predominantly another race, uh, for discussions, or they're uh, they're simply uh, inviting in a, an African American pastor and saying, "How can we help? Uh, what, what what tell us? Talk to us. What what should we do?" Um, and uh, so. Uh, I, I know one church uh, said, uh, uh, they made, they said, we have 6% uh, of the children in our weekly nursery school uh, child care, 6% are children of color. By the end of this year, we're going to make that 50%. We're, we're going to make it look like this neighborhood. We're going to go out and recruit, and we're going to subsidize and fund, and we're going to do what we can. We're going to change the board of the daycare center so that it represents what we want to look like. So I love that. Is a they were already had a ministry, 
they just needed to get that ministry better in line with who they wanted to be. Mm -hmm. so. uh, we have another question from uh, Elise. She asks, um, before the time of enlightenment that you discussed, uh, when I think you said that race was established to identify a slave subservient group, what would you say to this previous to this time? For example, the slavery class that built the pyramids in Egypt or the Hindu caste system? Yeah, I, I think it was sort of a unique, uh, we had slavery uh, down through human history. Um, and uh, the European Enlightenment really for the first time connected race with slavery. As if slavery, human slavery was not bad enough, uh, suddenly this was connected and it was connected as a justification for slavery. Slavery was dying out everywhere. Well, it was revived in colonialism and all. Um, one thing we should note, like in my own attempts to preach about these issues, uh, and you, you know, you, you struggle because I've said race is not really a biblical category. And yet, uh, there are categories of designation of human beings, such as Gentile, Jew, uh, Canaanite, Hebrew kind of things, where people are designated generally by their families, by their nationality, their nationality is not really the right word, but their tribe. And, uh, that, that is a biblical issue. It's interesting, generally, the, the Bible's testimony is, uh, particularly in the New Testament is, uh, get together, uh, overcome the boundaries. And Jesus Christ is the one who intensifies that. Uh, I'd say, by my reckoning, about a third of Paul's letters are written to divided churches. And what is the primary division that Paul is struggling with in his letters? It's the division between Gentile and Jew. And he, so Paul says things like, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Uh, 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 that has God even gone to the Gentiles? Yeah, God has in Jesus Christ. And so uh, our separations as they continue in race they can be informed by scripture. And where Paul, Galatians, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. Uh, we're all one in Christ. There, there is something to be said in our present moment. Um, one of, uh, the, or a couple of the other questions were, how can the United Methodist Church as a whole or is at least the American um, church work on anti-racism? And, and that leads, how can we be as individuals and as a church actively anti-racist? Um, I'd urge you not to worry too much about the Methodist church as a whole. <laughs> it's, it's getting smaller, I'll say that. Uh, I've, I despair, uh, frankly, when I look at the general church and United Method, the general, uh, the boards and agencies and all that other uh, sort of stuff that I believe is being dismantled uh, before our very eyes. Uh, worry about your own congregation and see your congregation as a God-given resource of, to work on this. Uh, for instance, this is a prejudiced Christian comment, uh, the only kind you'd expect me to make. But uh, I believe I could argue that there's certain controversial, difficult, painful questions that ought not to be discussed anywhere but in church. <laughs> they, uh, the Congress, uh, the, the, the Women's Club, uh, the Men's Gardening Club, you, they don't have the resources. We, we have the resources such as I mean, it's just amazing to have a, a tough controversial discussion and say, now, before we begin the discussion, just want to make clear, uh, I'm a sinner, and that affects a lot that I say and think in ways I don't even know. Uh, but maybe that's why God sent you. Uh, and you're a sinner, and I realize I'm talking with you, and you're responding out of your own fallenness with me. 
Now let's talk. Well, just being able to say that is one, or to say, let's have a knockdown, drag out argument. But let's promise at the end of this argument, we'll go to the Lord's table together. Uh, we will stay in this church. And uh, so I think uh, the church is, is a great location. And it is a great, uh, one of the great things about being bishop is I got to see a lot of, um, I would say to someone, how did you get started in this ministry at the local youth prison facility? Bringing cookies, doing birthday parties, uh, teaching reading. How did you get started in this? And a woman would say, well, uh, we have the Thursday morning uh, women's prayer group, Bible study, and uh, we got to talking about it. We, we just prayed, Lord, lead us, guide us. Next thing we know, we're making cookies at this prison, and it just you just could tell the Lord was leading us there. So I'm saying that Highlands is the ideal location to talk about this. And... Uh, to say to friends who say, I'm just so upset over this, I, I look at TV, I, 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 this Black Lives Matter has, has really, it, it's uncovered wounds and all. Uh, you can say, you know, you, you shouldn't be having struggle with this alone. Let me come to our church. We've got this group. We, we've got this church. And uh, so... Uh, we have a question from one of your favorite former students, Kevin Quick. Uh, uh, did Kevin tell you I, that he was a favorite? Ah, right. uh, or you know, something like that. Um, and he says, uh, currently, I told Kevin, I've, I've told Kevin, if, if I was as big as you are, I'd be more successful as a bishop. Uh, you know, just he's big. And when Kevin says, "All right, Sopranos, I'm looking at you. Come on, okay." <laughs> His question is, uh, currently there's a lot of conflict between police officers and Black Lives Matter protesters. Most recently, the secret police have snatched up pro protesters in Portland, Oregon. Many of us have had positive interactions with individual police officers, but we hear about corrupt police officers who kill Black people sometimes in their own homes as they sleep. These police officers are often not brought to justice and shielded by law enforcement. How ought we as Christians regard law enforcement officers in today's environment? Well, I, I hope Christians and law enforcement in some sense see themselves as this is part of their vocation. They're there for the Lord. They're there working with the Lord. And uh, we all, uh, many of us can testify uh, to ways that people in law enforcement have been uh, wonderful protectors and healers and guides to us uh, in our time. Um, I think, though, uh, to give someone a gun and a badge and to give someone uh, that kind of power and authority, uh, we, uh, we, we make demands upon them. Uh, we have certain standards they must adhere to. Sadly, our people in law enforcement are sadly underpaid, uh, which doesn't help matters. Uh, but nevertheless, m many of them see themselves there as, as a witness, as, as part of their vocation. And um, they should receive encouragement. Uh, for instance, I, I know churches that have a, a, a prayer group uh, for those in law enforcement, probation officers, policemen, uh, uh, judges, you know, and, and they get together and pray for one another and, and, and confess and talk to one another. Uh, I, I want to believe that those Christians in law enforcement in no way want to defend corrupt law enforcement people, uh, a police union, should be there to strengthen the police in their work, not to protect uh, those uh, who are not there. I, I do think it's it, the, the problem though, as Kevin maybe indicates, is it's more than just a, a few bad apples and that, that kind of rhetoric. Uh, it, it's systemic. 
Sadly, America often sends our police out on the streets to deal with deep, horrible injustice that the police had no part in creating. And they're sent out to, to kind of defend this. Uh, sometimes they're sent out with inadequate training. And so uh, I think the way to do that is to be honest about it. Uh, I had a great conversation a while back with someone in law enforcement who was just heartbroken. And, and he said, any policeman seeing the George Floyd tape, he said, any policeman I know is sick at their stomach. We work night and day to avoid encounters like that. And he said, I, I just wept. And I wept for George Floyd. And, and I just wept that, that human beings had been so defaced to get into that situation. So, um, but I think, again, it's a good thing to talk about. Uh, if I were a pastor, I think I'd, in the present moment, I'd want to be in contact with all the law enforcement personnel in my church to say, uh, help me understand what you're thinking. Uh, how can we help? What can we do? At the same time, I think we must be adamant that uh, injustice perpetrated, acts of violence perpetrated uh, by anybody, but especially by someone who's been given that power by the state to wear a gun and all. Uh, th this is something we have got to condemn in the strongest possible terms. I was part of a church that uh, uh, when I went into that church, the retiring pastor leaving said, be careful, son, this crowd loves to fight worse than any group I ever served, said some of the meanest people, they'd fight, they loved to, said, and I said, oh, well, what am I supposed to do? He said, you find them, you get them to fighting somebody other than you, or they'll turn on you and they'll kill you. And I said, oh, my Lord. Well, like a month later, we had a little ministry at the local jail where we provided toiletries kits to uh, and most of the people coming to the local jail were youthful offenders. Well, two of our women uh, observed police beating a young prisoner or roughing him up. And they reported it to the police chief. And he said, why don't you church women uh, stick to church and I'll stick to police work, okay? Thank you, goodbye. Uh, well, they reported that back to me. Somehow I worked that into next Sunday's sermon and I got indignant and I said, I am not going to sit here and let somebody talk to two of our dear saints that way. Anyway, long story short, out of that, we organized what we call the Helping Hands Ministry, where we hired a college student in the summers to be president at the jail. And uh, when the mayor told us that, when the police chief told us that we couldn't do it, one of the women in the church said, I taught the mayor in the eighth grade. He only has a high school diploma because of me. I'll talk to the mayor. And so anyway, I said, church, I love you. So, how is God calling your church to be a witness? Um, Cindy has asked, uh, how do you deal with Christians who don't think they need to confess or repent racism? Um, okay, you're, you're talking about just about everybody in my family uh, <laughs> and about every church I've served. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, hey, hey, remember now, you're talking to a preacher. And, um, you know, when someone says to me, you know, uh, the church you're serving is just full of people uh, with white racist attitudes. I say, yeah, uh, and, and by the way, I'm not happy about some of their marital uh, stuff either, uh, extramarital stuff. Uh, uh, some, I got a lot of people addicted. I got that. You know, to me, uh, it's, uh, as a preacher, kind of my job is to say to you on a regular basis, uh, hello, we're all together in our church, and isn't it wonderful to be here? Now, this morning, we're going to talk about a subject you've been avoiding all week. Um, uh, and, and by the way, 
it's not me wanting you to talk about this. Uh, I'm coming out of scripture. And this is the Lord uh, talking to you here. Th this, the Lord wants us to talk about this. Uh, Patsy used to say in Alabama, she could tell uh, when I was on, uh, when I was, felt I was on shaky ground, uh, she could tell by how often I use the word Jesus in my comments. Jesus expects us, and Jesus has called us together, and Jesus will enable us, and Jesus, well, darn it, it's the truth. And um, so uh, I think uh, this is one of the conversations we need to have. And, uh, and by the way, I found one way it's easier to get people to talk is maybe the way I began my remarks tonight, confession. Uh, you know who you're talking to here? You're talking to somebody born in Greenville, South Carolina. And, uh, and I'm not telling you, uh, my title tonight says a recovering racist. Maybe that was a little sensational, but um, that's who I think I am. I think I will be that way because I'm a recovering sinner. Uh, and uh, uh, the analogy I'm using there is like addiction, alcohol addiction. When you got a friend who's an alcoholic uh, and they're trying to do better and all, but they fall off the wagon, what do you do? Uh, you say, come on, come on now, get yourself back together, you can do this, let's get back on the wagon, and, um, and your recovery continues. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the way it is with race for white people like me in America. And, uh, and I'll just add one more thing. How do you talk to people about this situation in the church, I think partly you have faith that God wants us to succeed at this, that God has created us for better, that I don't have to say, well, you see, this was the way I was raised, or this was the way my, my grandma always taught me, yeah, yeah, uh, that, that, that God is behind this, God is instigating this, so we do that in that faith. I don't, uh, how are we doing on my time? I, I don't know what our time is tonight. Uh, we'll do two more questions and then we'll okay. wrap up. Um, so the follow-up to that is repenting is all well and good, but what as Methodists are we charged to do to address this now? He's wearing oh, that sounds very Wesleyan. Yeah, it does. <laughs> how about, you know, uh, I saw a Methodist church in Durham after the George Floyd thing uh, said, we're now spending the rest of the summer in lament. And I said, hey, look, enough of your lamenting already. Come on. Uh, how do you, you think God just wants us to feel bad? Uh, and, uh, you know, come on. Uh, so I, I love the question. Um, and I think, to me, that's a question that is best answered in your congregation. Uh, in that um, I wonder, are there churches nearby that you could look at as best practices? Are there congregations that have been taking this seriously for a long time? That could be helpful. Uh, another thing you can do is pray and say, Lord, give us, make us part of your mission. Where is your mission and how can we hitch on to it? Uh, so I, I love it when specific groups. Uh, I know uh, I know a, a church uh, and they were asking these questions about what can we do and someone said well we we could have a study group. They said we've already had study groups. I don't want to sit around anymore and talk about this kind of thing and uh, said well we could uh, we can also pray and, and somebody said we have two members of the town council are members of this church. Uh, most of the people in this church are very well off, powerful people. Uh, three of the members of the school board are in this church. Uh, come on. Uh, uh, we, God has given us a situation where we can actually impact something. I, and I think what they did was they, they called all those people together who were public servants, who were elected officials in the church. And they said, how can we help you do what we really know you want to do? And uh, 
they engaged in political activism in that town, but they didn't call it political activism. They called it, uh, you know, trying to be good Christian witnesses. And uh, uh, so uh, I really believe God can lead you to move beyond talking about it to, to action. And for our final question, um, the, um, I have to read the whole thing to you. Uh, Jim Smith asked uh, or said, I heard a black man asked whether he'd rather be faced with a liberal white person or a member of the Klan. And he said, neither. How do we get from liberal progressive members of our church who aren't confessing their racism and asking God to change their hearts? Um, oh, how do we, and I think, and that's kind of what we have talked about a lot last night as we huh. talked about the reality of white fragility and that, you know, so often we think, well, because it, it feels like it attacks our character. I'm not a racist. I, I, I know I'm, I'm a woke person. Um, but even you know, the wokest white person still has so much to learn, right? Um, there's always, because we are socialized in a white supremacist society, there's always things to uncover. So even to the most open-minded liberal white person among us, you know, what is your... Um... Yeah, I think it's, it, it, I, in, in that book, I liked, that book about that and that it kind of called out, named mm -hmm. uh, people like me <laughs> and my friends who say, look, uh, I've, I've dealt with racism. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't have a racist bone in my body, blah, blah, blah. Uh, as the book notes, uh, ooh, that overlooks uh, the tax structure, the lending structure, the school systems, the, the economic, the inheritance taxes, all that. Um, and um, I would, one way I think we're helped is, um, Methodists used to be big on this with testimonials, but I, I bet you in that group you're describing, there are people who have made some amazing moves. There are people, uh, my own sister, who a college professor, retired, uh, and she was talking about uh, talking with a colleague, and uh, she was saying, uh, "Well, I grew up very differently, but but fortunately, I I've become aware, and I'm aware." And and she said, uh, for instance, uh, one of my closest colleagues uh, here in the department, uh, here at the university, uh, is is black. And uh, we, uh, we, we work on things together, we get together and all. And the other person said, uh, do you know our children's names? And my sister said, oh, you know, I, I think uh, maybe, uh, and she said, uh, how often have you uh, entertained her or been to her home? and said, uh, uh, uh. anyway, for my sister, she just said it was a wonderful kind of moment of saying, ooh, wow, uh, gosh, some of my big declarations need to be checked out. And um, so if we could see this as, as growth, and again, I find so many wonderful analogies for how you grow in your racial attitudes to how you grow closer to Jesus and you grow in the Christian faith and you keep thinking to yourself, wow, I'm really a, a, a fairly faithful Christian disciple. And then you have something in which you disappoint yourself and disappoint the Lord and you pick up and, and go on. Um, so I, I would just say, <clears throat> uh, I'll close with a quote that I worked relentlessly in Alabama. Uh, from Gary Wills, the Northwestern historian. And Gary Wills said, if, if you're a white male uh, over 50 from the South, guilty on all, there is no way I can convince you people can't change. 
because you have experienced such dramatic change in your family, uh, in your culture, in your own heart. Uh, well, that's a, that's a West, he's a Catholic, but that's a Westland comment to say, uh, hey, come on, this is North Carolina. Do you know where we were 30 years ago? Do you, do you know who we were electing to office? Do you, you know, hey, we've made some progress. There's a lot more to be made, but, but people can change. And uh, it, it's that it is a Christian claim that we ought to have to make good every time we meet it, when we talk about our lives. It's a Christian claim that in the power of Jesus Christ, you can live a different life than the one you were bred to live. And for all of us white American types, liberal, conservative, whatever, I think that's our hope. Thank you so much, Bishop. Uh, thank you everyone who came tonight. Uh, we had someone here who is in Portland, Oregon. Um, she oh wow, wonderful. In the chat. Um, so we are glad that you could be with us tonight, Claudia. Um, all of those around North Carolina who are here from different places, our Highland folks, our Social Justice Forum folks, uh, thank you for being here. Um, I didn't introduce myself at the beginning, but hi, I'm Amanda, the Associate Pastor at Highland. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned earlier at Highland, we are in the uh, few weeks into our Act Now to End Racism program. You can go to highlandumc.org to learn more. Um, we'll have uh, another presentation in a couple of weeks by a former African American studies professor, Dr. Linda Edwards, who will be talking about Dr. King's letter from a uh, Birmingham jail. Mm. And um, I had that letter framed, uh, a copy of it framed in my office when I was bishop. Oh, and wonderful. It was addressed to one of my predecessors. Mm. So mm -hmm. it meant a lot to me. Yeah. Um, but feel free to join uh, any of those, any of you. Um, we have, oh, we even have one in, in California. Well, Jean, we are glad you could be with us. Uh, this is, has been recorded, and so we will post that on Highland's um, website, and uh, you can find out where, how to access it there, um, highlandumc.org. Um, I believe it's slash act now. But thank you so much, Bishop, for being with us. Thank you. Good Thank night. you, Joe. And if it's okay, I will close us in a word of prayer. Uh, Creator God, we give you thanks for this time together, uh, for this time of sharing and testifying, for this time of celebrating the changes that you make in our hearts and lives as you draw us closer to your perfecting love, closer in your perfecting love. Give us hearts ever more open to the call and cry of our brothers and sisters. Give us hands ready for action, minds willing to unlearn and rediscover. Make us thirsty for you, O oh God. Keep us safe until we gather together once more, we pray. In your holy name, amen. Thank you so much, everyone. Go in peace and um, have a good night.